Hello, welcome to Catch Technical. My name is Jill Mooney and I am Head of Catch Technical Services. So who are Catch Technical? We are a team of expert consultants brought together by Catch. Our consultants can work individually on a specific project or collaboratively to manage and deliver a complex program of works. Catch Technical is supported by our partner ESC Limited. So why would you choose Catch Technical? Change may be coming to your business because of COVID-19, climate change or steadily advancing and changing health, safety and environment requirements post-Brexit. Whether it's around regulatory compliance, supply chain operations and improvements, improving HSC performance through workforce engagement or delivering advanced and highly technical projects on time. Catch Technical can help you. Catch Technical consultants are carefully selected, providing specialist project support to businesses seeking to sustain and improve in these fast changing times. Our diverse team has over 250 years of demonstrated experience delivering multi million pound projects across all sectors energy, chemicals, personal care and food industries to name a few. We offer bespoke advice, training and solutions based on deep technical understanding, insightful analysis and industry knowledge. We pride ourselves on our attentive and a collaborative approach, offering a whole project solution. Our clients, whether in Yorkshire, Humberside, Lincolnshire or beyond, should be confident in our experience, consistent approach and trustworthiness. So ESC is just, um, it's a consultancy specialising in technical safety um, with a massive um, level of experience in functional safety. Uh, part of our board of directors includes the people that were sitting there on the day that the standards for functional safety were developed. We um, operate in most industries, including um, the typical oil and gas, petrochemical. Um, we also support uh, companies in the fields of uh, biohazard um, utilities, military and manufacturing industries of many types, as well as product manufacturers for safety critical devices. Uh, we really, our focus is to, to be here to help end users, owners, designers, operators to uh, to plan manage their assets and projects more safely and successfully we deliver a number of aspects associated with technical safety um, functional safety is a big part of that but we, we actually do a bit more than that and we we collaborate with catch technical services and the consultants uh, therein uh, to support broader requirements that tend to be horizontal links to the our core business. So a bit about myself, uh, I'm Paulo Oliveira, I'm um, an Associate Director at ESC. I've, uh, I've been working in safety related applications uh, for over 15 years uh, with 10 years of ex uh, direct experience in asset management and safety application development and validation. Uh, 61508 and 61511, the two standards, uh, probably more known for functional safety um i've been most of the the work i've been doing although i've delved into other uh, relevant and linked um, standards uh, and that included competence compliance certification of systems of people um, and products i'm currently a member of uh, the british standard institute gel 6501 committee which is the committee that implements uh, system safety requirements uh, based on international guidance like the international um, standards for functional safety uh, and I'm part of the the executive board for the safety uh, system safety technical professional network uh, for the Institute of Engineering Technology which supports the BSI um, group as well 
I've delivered many seminars, many webinars lately uh, due to current circumstances. Um, I've delivered quite a number of uh, training courses, including the accredited TV Rhineland uh, Functional Safety Engineer CIS course. Um, my experience on technical safety is, is quite broad. I've uh, shared um, a number of studies, I've kind of lost count, including FMEAs, process hazard analysis, HAZOPS, uh, layer protection analysis, functional safety assessments. Um, also, uh, conducting audits, developing uh, management plans, competency management um, structures, and providing uh, consultancy, ongoing consultancy um, to, to companies that, that need the support. So today, I'm going to talk about a, um, a topic that's quite close to my heart with regards to what I do, and it's about target risk. Um, as the, the topic of the, the presentation suggests, I'm, I'm asking a question to the audience and to myself. Um, safety in numbers, is target, target risk really just a number? And today we're going to delve into how we look at target risk and how we actually have to widen the considerations be way beyond that number to effectively manage uh, risk associated with a asset, an installation, or even a, a an organization. We're going to divide today's discussions in three parts. Uh, the, an introduction, um, then I'm going to talk about a topic that's um, very, very important within the, the world of functional safety, which is systematic capability. And then I am going to hopefully break the walls of that concept outside of functional safety and talk a bit about why those those principles apply to, to risk management as a whole, including process safety. So let's get started. So risk targets, um, we all in one way or another come across risk targets daily uh, whether it's our own appetite for doing a certain task where we perceive a level of risk associated with it, it could be making a cup of tea it could be um, putting some decking in your back garden it could be driving your car um, and nowadays it could be going to the supermarket and understanding the risks that you might be exposing yourself with regards to um, uh, the COVID-19 situation. So we, we come across those every day. We don't think about them as formal risk targets, but we, we, we do come across them. And we, in almost an inherent way, have to make decisions based on those risk targets and that perception of risk. So it's part and parcel of what we do every day. However, when we formalize a risk target, we often don't ask what is it telling us? Why do we have that target there? And why do we need it? And this first part of the, the presentation is really to get us thinking a bit about how we make use of those risk targets every day in our day jobs, whether we're an operator of a site, whether we're a manufacturer of uh, equipment that will have a, a safety implication, or even people um, involved with activities that might have an impact in that uh, level of risk. Um, and then also talk a bit about how do those targets and those um, bits of information that we have to, to deal with every day actually reflect reality. And how does that um, impact our decision making? So if we start with the risk target, um, formalized risk targets um, are in many shapes and in, in, uh, in formats. Um, just, just a quick note to remind participants to mute their microphones uh, if anyone's just joined, so that uh, there's no feedback. I, I keep um, getting a bit of noise coming through. Uh, so back to it. Um, so risk targets, we come across them in many different ways. Um, we 
within our organization we might have a, a defined um, risk target it might actually look like the alarp triangle that um, the hse uses to demonstrate the the principle of um, risk reduction it could be a risk matrix and all of those are trying to help us have a a, a site um, into where we need to be with regards to a particular hazard, a particular um, task, a particular aspect of our application. These techniques to quantify a risk and to define boundaries are, um, are well known, but are often unchallenged with regards to how that information is actually used. So, for example, if we look at the, the um, as low as reasonably practicable um, diagram on the, the right hand side of the, the screen, there's a number of boundaries defined. And do we actually understand what intolerable risk means? Do we know what that means every day when we're doing a task? What decisions do we make when we actually come across intolerable risk? How does tolerable risk translate itself to a, um, a discussion about additional protection? How does the ALARP argument actually sit with day-to-day -day tasks? And is acceptable risk really the final target of everything we do? Or is it more of a concept that we need to explore a bit more? So I'm proposing that the next few minutes we, we go through that journey and we try to understand why the risk targets are not simply points in the matrix or in a, um, a triangle or even numbers and what does that mean in terms of uh, actually implementing what do we need to implement to achieve that level of um, safety that we need so I, i'd like to kind of deconstruct um, expressions especially uh, nowadays there's so many expressions and jargon in technical safety and in engineering that I think it's important to bring it back to basics. So I understand that had a look at uh, a number of definitions of risk target and I particularly liked the CCPS definition um, of risk target. They, they define it as a objective based risk criteria established as goals or guidelines for performance. Now, if we look at those words and we kind of link it to what they are actually trying to tell us um, we could say that actually a risk target according to the CP ccps is a goal for our risk performance associated with an asset with a um, operating plant with a specific task and those words are quite important because we've gone from the previous slide showing us very clear zones of risk with lovely colors telling you this is not good this is better to now talk, talking about things that infer certain meanings for example objective based infers there's deliverables so we, we should be delivering something as part of that risk target a goal infer, infers that we are aiming at something and that kind of raises the question if we're aiming at some something what's the level of accuracy we need to apply guideline infers interpretation because the way i interpret a guideline might be different to the way each one of you interprets it and performance without uh, without a doubt infers variability um, any kind of uh, execution of a task or any kind of um, activity depending on a number of things including human factors including the context it's in including um, the, the actual equipment the actual asset that's being uh, looked after will introduce a level of variability that we need to understand so that takes me all the way back to so why is the risk target there how does that translate into what we need to do and how is it used 
every day to actually quantify that we're basically achieving that level of safety. So probably you guys, are, as you're listening to, to me and are rabbiting on a bit about this, you're thinking, yeah, well, we get a risk target. That risk target then needs to be used to verify um, how what we have to protect us against that identified risk meets that target and you know that's it we we have a risk target we compare it to what we have and then we say yeah i'm good i'm safe and with that in mind let's get into that part of the discussion so we now have a risk target and i've challenged the idea that it's just a number it, it, i think it's a lot more it's a it's an ambition it's a, um, an interpretation of a contextual requirement associated with a specific uh, application or context that requires us to understand what that context is before we can actually use that number. So when we do our analysis and we look at risk reduction, we're going to do the same thing, and we? We, we are going to ask the same question. So why do we estimate risk reduction? How do we use it every day and how much does it reflect reality? So many of you would have been um, involved in studies like layer protection analysis, fault tree analysis, and you would have seen um, a number of estimates, even trees, that give you a number that you then compare to the previous number and you say, yeah, those two numbers meet, we're good. And that is typically what the risk target and the the risk reduction parameters are used for to give us that level of assurance that we're meeting the target but actually meeting that target means a lot of things it doesn't just mean that two numbers are exactly the same or one is a bit lower than the other so why do we estimate risk reduction why do we go through all that work to quantify a number and then make that decision and do we actually do that every day or is it an activity we do once and put it on a shelf and does that number really reflect what you have out there because when you're comparing with your target and assuming that your target is the final answer are we using numbers that tell us how our plants are really operating or are we using numbers that we know give us a good chance to meet it so all these questions are part of the argument is there safety in numbers is that really just a number on that tar target risk so continuing with the topic of risk reduction um, we we quantify that risk reduction depending on um, what we're trying to define as those risk reduction measures that will give us that level of safety so we we talk about probabilities of failure on demand on equipment that that is likely to sit there and wait for a demand to occur to provide the protection or we talk of overall failure rate if it's a, a, a higher demand type of equipment or simply a, a bit of equipment that is in use and might have a um, might be a cause of those um, of those scenarios those those um, risks. We also talk about risk levels and risk gaps, meaning um, are we experiencing high high risk if we lose a certain type of equipment or if your asset operates in a certain way. We talk about risk gap as in what we have doesn't quite meet the target. We talk about integrity levels, safety integrity levels, environmental integrity levels, and we talk about acceptable risk versus current risk. All these are kind of mixed in to make decisions every day and they can be translated into things like maintenance types and intervals operate or shut down an asset equipment technology selection at the beginning of a project a pfd could dictate the type of equipment you go you go for or the the level of um, redundancy you apply but it could be also that the failure rate that's acceptable for the operation of your asset and the requirements operationally and safety wise could dictate that you actually need a different technology. Um, if you want to grow your asset, if you want to uh, expand your site, you will consider things like this to know, is it going to deliver the benefit I need to with regards to um, availability targets, etc. 
So we look at all this to make decisions every day. And we look at it, these risks to make those decisions. And we're using those numbers to justify to ourselves that the decision is correct. So at this point, I will give you just 10 seconds to think to yourself how comfortable you are that that number holds the answer. And whilst you're thinking about that, I'll leave you with this thought that many, many years ago, a gentleman called Pythagoras put out there. And he, he states that the number is the ruler of forms and ideas and the cause of gods and demons. I quite like that quote as he expresses perfectly what I'm trying to, to pass on in this presentation is that a number is a extremely powerful thing for good on and for bad reasons. So for the first part, we've been talking about the concepts and we've been deconstructing some of the ideas that maybe that number has other meanings that we're not effectively tackling when we talk about risk targets. Probably the best way to put that in perspective is to talk about some real world um, cases. So we have risk targets, we have LARP regions, we have risk matrices, we have PFDs, we have fault tree analysis, we have all that stuff together. But what does the real world incidents tell us? Well, I've, I've picked four, I could have picked 10. And I went and had a look at the, um, the reports, investigation reports at each one of them, which the majority of you will be familiar with. And I looked at what was quoted as the key causes associated with these incidents, the key things that drove the whole domino leading to the incident. And one thing was really, really clear. There was more than one reason in most of them. Things like alarm management, maintenance practices, human factors associated with VP taxes, specification and maintenance of equipment for safety, high reliability organizations, communication between third parties, contracts, etc. for Bunsfield. Management of change in Flixborough was the backbone of that incident. And for Boeing 737 MAX, management of change, software validation, development processes, they were all quoted. I was kind of left with a question. Where are the numbers? Because in all of these, the focus is not on quantifying a number. So that made me curious. And that made me want to think about risk in a slightly different way. Being a functional safety um, focused engineer, I went back to the standards that I use to calibrate my approach and I tried to understand how does functional safety ad address this. Um, and on some interesting insights, which I, I'm going to share with you guys next and the, the second part of our presentation. So in this part, I'm going to take you through how in the context of functional safety, systematic capability is used to address those causes, those things that drove those incidents. Some of you are going to be familiar with what this, this slide is going to show, some of you won't. Uh, in both cases, I think it's valuable that we, we have a, a bit of time to discuss this. In 2003, the Health and Safety Executive conducted a research um, on incidents associated with control systems, and they identified that the primary causes of incidents were built into the safety systems in the majority of the cases. Um, if you have a bit of pen and paper, just note down the number of causes that were inbuilt, a percentage, and what you, th what you thought was the, the major cause. You might be surprised, you might not. What was found in that research was that more than 60% of the failures were there before you used them. Um, specification issues and change and installation, 
uh, issues, design and implementation, operating maintenance and changes after commissioning were considered. And if you look, design implementation, installation and commissioning and specification take the biggest large chunk of that pie, which means the errors are there, the problems are there, even before we press the start button. And this actually drove a, uh, a number of questions, a number of challenges, including, okay, so if the errors are there, regardless of how good we are with our numbers and risk targets and confirming that we meet the target, can we assume that the focus on numbers is just unnecessary? Topic is complex enough, safety systems are complex enough, safety risks are complex enough. Should we do the right things at the right time and hope it's enough? Well, quoting um, a number of people that work for Google, hope is not really a strategy. And to do so would probably undermine um, your ability to address those errors that could lead to a potential um, unwanted risk on your plant or system. So how does functional safety address this? Um, functional safety, when the initial discussions about the need to have a framework for safety systems started, the focus was, do we understand how systems fail? And do we understand how to stop them from failing like that? So the concept of a safety life cycle was developed. And if for those eagle-eyed amongst you, you'll notice that the phases of the life cycle that's shown on the, the screen, which is for the 61511 uh, sector specific standard for functional safety, which is for the process industries, actually maps out quite well to that previous diagram. We have hazard and risk assessment, allocation of safety functions and safety requirement specification, which you could easily put in the specification box. Equally, the design and engineering would fit perfectly on the design and the installation commissioning and validation would fit perfectly in installation and commissioning activities. So the life cycle is based on those ideas and those findings. And it proposes that to manage safety associated with systems, there's a number of activities and tasks that need to be conducted to allow us to clearly identify the potential of introduction of errors, to manage those, and to validate and verify those activities. So you have peripheral activities like the management activities and functional safety assessment slash auditing activities. You have your structure and your planning that needs to be defined, and you have verification activities running through the life cycle. The life cycle itself identifies where we identify and specify the requirements, how we design to them, how we install commission, those um, engineered systems, how we operate and maintain them, how we change them and how we decommission them. And all of those have interim phases or stages where you actually assess your alignment with the expectations of what you said you were going to do to manage that risk. And those are the functional safety assessments, stage one, two, three, four, and five. Stage three, particularly important because it's prior to introduction of hazards. So prior to pressing the start button and actually having that system there to protect you. So this approach is a structured approach with clearly identified verification and validation activities. These two words have specific meanings uh, within the standard. And it makes use of proven approaches for the development of systems. It's very little within it that's revolutionary and new. And it has specifically defined requirements for managing, implementing, auditing, assessing performance and compliance with how you propose to manage that risk or that risk reduction. And yes, there's some numbers in there too. But 
80% of the standard is addressing the other aspect of risk reduction, the systematic capability. So, how does this look in practice? Because I can talk about the life cycle for the rest of the day and you guys will be bored, terribly bored. You probably wouldn't be in the call for much longer. But I thought the best way to, to do it is to take you through, kind of walk you through how, how it happens in standard and how you get to a point where you have to apply certain things to prevent that, that error from kind of propagating through the life cycle. So, for those who've seen SIL tables, um, that's on the standard 615.11, and it identifies a uh, what we call a target failure measure, which is either a probability of failure on demand or a average failure rate per hour, dangerous failure rate per hour, uh, depending on the, the operating mode, a high demand, high demand or low demand mode. And then you have your SILs that are assigned to bands of these frequencies or probabilities. And then you have what the standard asks you to do. Now, don't worry too much about that picture because I will take you through it. So how, how do we get from uh, having some numbers to actually knowing what we need to do as well as the numbers bit? Well, if you've done an assessment of any sort, um, a has or pelopa, and you've identified the need for a safety function, you'd need to quantify the target SIL. And you do that by estimating the probability of failure on demand required for that safety function, or the risk gap that would need to be plugged in by a safety function. And you do that by identifying what the PFD is, if it's a low demand system, which will then give you a SIL requirement. Well, that SIL requirement then needs to be satisfied. And that is done by looking at how you go from having a safety integrity level that had a PFD as the origin to then saying, okay, so if I need to meet a SIL 2, what does that mean? That means I need to quantify the failure. So that's the numbers bit. I need to look at what redundancy I need, starting to dilute that numbers bit a bit. But also, I need to define my systematic safety integrity. And that means, how do I go about developing this system to avoid error, to avoid introduction of errors that could undermine the ability of this system for doing what it needs to do? And those packages um, of specific, specified techniques and measures are very, very known to all engineering disciplines. They include adequate project management configuration management. They uh, include competence management, making sure that the people executing tasks in the life cycle are actually competent to do so. And making sure that those people are actually given the correct information through that life cycle to execute those tasks by verifying the input and output of those phases. It also includes validation against specification. So we said we needed something to close that gap. We've engineered it, we've installed it. Before we use it, it'd be nice to go and say, right, looking at what I needed as a specification, have I achieved that? And if I've achieved that, I have a level of assurance that it's going to do what I needed to do. If I haven't achieved that, what decisions do I need to make? Very seldomly, that decision is about a probability of failure on demand not meeting a target. And even more rarely, um, that at that point of validating, the PFD is the biggest concern. But it doesn't stop there. So we've designed it. It meets it. We've it meets the targets. We've applied those packages and techniques, and we've met the SIL requirement. So what happens when we start operating it? Remember the three questions I asked at the beginning about risk targets and risk reduction. 
how much of your analysis reflects real life. You still need to look at those two aspects and confirm that that's still applicable. Is your failure rate still correct? Is your, your architecture and voting still applicable? But more importantly, are the practices that you've developed and implemented and placed as a requirement for that risk reduction being observed, like the frequency of testing, the coverage of that testing, the recording of faults, the understanding and um, levels of investigation into failures when you needed the system to operate, and the reintegration into the analysis, refreshing that knowledge that you had when you first started and very likely only estimated what you were going to need. So this is within the 61508 and 11 uh, standards as an intrinsic uh, part of how to do functional safety. And it isn't a activity with a start and a finish, but an activity with many, many loops of iteration, depending on the operational phase or developmental phase uh, of the product asset or site. So, okay, so for functional safety, we have something and it seems to work. Um, sure, some of you might disagree. So, what does that mean outside? Of functional safety. Well, let's let's strip it back. Let's talk about process safety, or let's talk about risk management as a whole. Let's take the safety out of the safety. If you have a risk, whether it's operational, whether it's financial, whether it's safety, environmental, that risk needs to be managed. And the most likely way you're going to manage through that risk is by understanding where your problem is, having a depth of experience and um, knowledge to define the solution, having the right people implementing that solution, verifying that that solution is giving you the, the correct um, output, and continuing to challenge that. These are continuous improvement processes are at their best. The Six Sigmas, the quality management systems, all these are based on the plan, do, check, act principle. This standard is no different. I usually wind up our, our board's directors by telling them that this is really a quality management standard with a technical aspect, which they don't take very lightly. The reality is systematic capability applies to every aspect of risk management and the way to address risk requires us to have a structured approach, to have adequate project management uh, approaches that are structured, systematic and systemic in nature. That configuration management, whether it's document, software, um, information as a whole, needs to be in place so that we understand which one is the up-to-date information, which one is historical, which one is an estimate for the future, which one's forecasting. Competency management, ensuring the right people are doing the right tasks. Planning and execution of defined life cycle activities. Throughout the life of a plant, there's clear stages that need to happen. And there's a clear need for adequate planning for those stages. Without planning, we're, start, we're going back into hope as a strategy. The stage gate assessments give you alignment. Um, if you do them more often, it's an increased burden, but your alignment is likely to be maintained closer to the bone. If it's less often, it's more likely that closer to operational status, you'll have more areas that you might need to address. Um, and that past that operational phase as well, looking at is this what I thought at the beginning, does it reflect the reality now? Testing, it's a bit like the message for COVID-19, testing is key, whether it's testing of the equipment, testing of the assumptions, testing of the estimates, testing of the practices, that needs to be happening, whether it's in form of an ongoing monitoring auditing process, uh, whether it's part of your change management, whether it's all of those, it needs to continue happening without that, it will not 
allow you to validate the benefit of what you have. And if you add to that some statistical and probabilistic analysis, whether you're dealing with financial risk, um, safety risk, or any other type of risk, it will help you on top of all these things to say, well, taking into account that I do all these things and we've applied all these good principles that are proven by historical use, I also have this number that gives me just the cherry on top of the cake to say it looks like I'm doing the right thing so I can make a decision based on that. So really the message to me is safety in numbers I'll probably translate, translate that to if we have good recognized engineering practices that we audit and monitor and implement adequately, if we had good and adequate uh, competency management with supported by good planning, verification, validation activities against specific requirements and a structure modular approach to execution of any of the tasks within the life of an asset, I'll probably say it's safety um, safety is in all of those and the appropriate use of mathematical tools to support the application of the above. So safety in numbers, if everything else is being followed rather than safety in numbers and the other stuff to add. Um, it's quite often I, I hear clients and colleagues talk to me about how, um, how important it is that they've met that target, that they have that number and everything seems okay. And when I challenge them about things like, okay, so how do you know that the equipment that's been used to meet that target has been developed in a way that it didn't introduce errors and that number actually doesn't mean anything. And they look at me as if to say, that's not my problem. Actually, if you're using it, it is your problem. It is your responsibility to ask the question. And Fundamentally, nowadays, understanding what's been done beyond the numbers is key to avoid cases like uh, Bunsfield, cases like Flixborough, and cases like the other incidents we've seen in industry. The over focus on that number, on the SIL, on the PFD, on the risk target, will basically cause a, a, a gap. Of understanding. Um, so the numbers are there to support the application of the good practices rather than the other way around. Uh, a good certificate is only worth the analysis that underpins it. So yes, safety in numbers if everything else is in place. So I hope you enjoyed my little diatribe about target risks and what it actually means to to deal with target risk um, and obviously a bit about functional safety, which is uh, my my little uh, bucket of tricks. Um, I'm more than happy to take any questions if any were presented. Thank you very much for your attention and hopefully we'll hear from you soon. It's, um, hello, it's Mick Hegarty at Green Energy Biofuels. Uh, it's not so much a question but a statement. I like the um, I like the overall picture that's been painted, and I think that uh, for the majority of us, we're into numbers at the beginning because somebody started it, and it becomes best practice, and the HSC like it, uh, and you're forced down the route of starting with the numbers. I think it's my understanding anyway. So this has been useful. Thank you. Um... Thanks, Mick. That, that's a really, really good point. Um, right at the beginning of the, the journey, as you do your hazard assessments and your LOPAs, and you, you define that target failure measure, it does drive a behavior. And um, that's one of the concerns I've always had is that design seems to end when the number is met. Whilst um, the companies I've been supporting, um, a lot of the conversations I have with them is about Okay, that, that number is given, but do you know how they got to that number? What analysis has been done? Is it based on field returns or is it someone in a lab coming up with some figures that seem reasonable to him in isolation? 
So yeah, absolutely right. Uh, the numbers at the beginning seem to drive a behavior. And um, that's something that we're quite conscious as part of the, the 615.11 committee and as part of ESC to help people understand that that's literally just the gateway for everything else you need to consider. Right. Cheers. Anybody else? Anybody else got any comments or questions? So in the light of what you've just said, Paolo, it's Rachel, sorry. Um, what would be, if you were going into an organisation, what would be the kind of statements or behaviours that would sort of set your spider senses tingling to say, I, I think this organisation has a problem with how they've used their numbers and I wouldn't necessarily be confident that the real world uh, is going to match that? Um, there, there's usually an acid test when I, when I talk to clients and if it's a, a new organizer, for example, if they brought me in to support a new project and when I asked them, um, what are your perceived gaps at the moment? And they quote numbers to me, for example, well, we have a risk target of one, uh, one e to the minus five. Uh, but we're discussing, should we really be targeting this number? Should we be targeting that number? And they don't actually tell me why they're talking about those targets. Conversely, if it's a, a plant that's been there for 30, 40 years, and they tell me that, yeah, we're, we're good, actually. We, we only have um, two or three safety functions on site, and they meet the target, so that, that's okay. That type of language to me tells me Okay, you're looking at the numbers. You're not actually telling me what you have in place and where your concerns are, which probably means you haven't looked at the other activities. Uh, one another thing, a big red flag for me is when people um, ask me a question about uh, meeting targets, me meeting risk targets. For example, they're setting key performance indicators, or they're um, intending on. Um, sending some information to the regulator with regards to the compliance. And the first thing they send me is SIL certificates for equipment. That usually um, is the start of a very long conversation about how the certificate is pretty much worthless. Well, thank you very much. Yeah, um, it's obviously, yeah, you kind of then have to take them on a, on a paradigm shifting journey, don't you? Indeed, indeed. <laughs> Anybody else? Anybody else like to chip in? No? No? Okay. All right. Well, I'd like to thank Paolo for delivering the webinar today. Um, obviously, Paolo and ESC are a partner at Catch Technical. If there is any advice, help, business support you need, then please get in touch with us. Um, as I've said earlier, we have um, experts from across the supply chain who will be able to help you. You will receive a follow up email from me later today, and that's just to ask for some feedback um, and to thank you for attending today, basically. And don't forget, um, Catch Technical and Palo are offering up to 30 minutes, three telephone consultation. Um, to follow up from the webinar today. So if you'd like to take up that offer, then please um, let me know on the feedback questionnaire. And thank you for your time today. And thank you to Paolo for delivering um, what is a fascinating subject. Thank you. And keep safe, everybody. Thank you very much. Bye-bye.